Mr. Sheriff, y'all may be seated. Members of the jury will recall when the defense is case of punishment. Mr. Gill, will you please call your next witness? Raymond Keener. If you would please come to the front of the courtroom. And if you could please raise your right hand. You swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth. Yes, sir. Please have a seat. We respond to any questions from Mr. Gill. To the left, and perhaps also Mr. Thomas, who is in front of you at the meantime. You may proceed. Tell the jury your name, please. Uh, Raymond Keener. Spell it for us, please. R A Y M O N D. Keener's K E E N E R. You're here in uniform today. How are you employed? I work, I'm a patrol officer with the Ball Springs Police Department. And you're in Ball Springs Police Department uniform here today, aren't you? Yes, sir. How long have you been with Ball Springs? Ten years. And I take it you're a commissioned peace officer in the state of Texas? Yes, sir. What level certification do you carry? I'm an advanced certification. How many levels of certification are you above basic? I'm into it goes basic, intermediate, advanced, and masters. I'm just lacking a few months having my masters. What did you do before you were a Ball Springs police officer? I work for uh, Banzac County Sheriff's Office. Do you live out in Banzac County? Yes, sir, I do. During your course of the course of your employment with the Ball Springs Police Department, did you come to know a person by the name of Roy Oliver? Yes, sir. And is Mr. Oliver the, the second person over here to my right? Yes, sir. And how did you come to know, know Mr. Oliver? We worked together. You know, we started off, and I, I was already there. Um, we became good friends. And when you say good friends, uh, good, good work friends, good social friends outside of work, how do you characterize the friendship? I'd say both. I don't associate a lot with you know the people I work with because I want to separate my work from my home life. I mean, that's the way I've been able to stay in this job for almost 20 years. Uh, Oliver's one of the one we've actually gone hunting together, and he's actually been to my house and. You know, I had good times and stuff like that. So I mean, I've associated with him quite a bit outside of work. But when you say you don't associate with a lot of officers outside of work, what is it about Roy that, that made you want to associate with him? The kind of person he is to me. I mean, he's a, he was a great, great officer. Uh, we've, you know, I've seen the way he takes care of people, how he takes care of his family, and uh, that impresses me a lot. How much time have you spent with him on the job? Since he started. Um, he, uh, we worked on shifts several times together. Back when I had my canine, he was one of the very few <laughs> that would actually put on a suit and help me with that big dog, you know. And that wasn't an easy chore to, for anybody, but he was always willing to help with that. Did you tell me about uh, something this morning about having lost your partner? Yes, sir. Two years ago, uh, my partner Olaf passed away at the house. Uh, pretty devastating for me. Uh, and still to this day, is real sensitive. And during that time when I was off, uh, one of the very few officers that called and actually made contact with me about every day just to check on me and make sure I was doing okay. And, and that was Roy? Yes, sir. Is that just the kind of guy he is? Yes, sir. How was he as a police officer? He was a good officer. I mean, I, I would, I'd walk through the gates of hell with him. I mean, I'd never question it. I mean, I'd be there with him. Uh, he always made good sound decisions. Uh, very caring, loving officer. Uh, I've watched him socialize with people while he was at work and take pictures and photos with kids and stuff, and they wanted to see the police officer set in their vehicle. He was always that officer. It was really, really quick to jump up and, and try to do what he could for the public. Was he good with people? Yes, sir. Was he good with kids? Yes, sir. Was he good with all kinds of kids? Yes, sir. Was Ball Springs made up of a, is a pretty diverse community? Yes, sir. Not only not only uh, ethnically, but also uh, uh, economically? Yes, sir. Did you find him to be good around all kinds of people? Treated everybody the same. Is that the kind of person you want? backing you up if you get in a bad situation as an officer? It's exactly the person I want taking care of me, backing me up. Has he had occasion to back you up before? 
many a times. Have you had occasion to back him up? Yes, sir. Is that a is that a good way to measure another officer? Yes, it is. Just as to how he performs as a backup. My life's in his hands. When I had an old office here, I always had to pick an officer because my job duties with the canine was to watch my dog, observe my dog, and uh, the tracking, or you know, if I was going after a suspect or anything, I had to pick an officer because obviously I'm not going to be able to take care of the dog and confront a deadly force if I had to. Uh, so I had to, I always picked an officer, and it was if he was there, that was him. He was the only one I wanted backing me up when I had to, when I was unable to take care of myself. Why is that? Because I trust him. Is that probably the most important thing about being out on the streets with someone? You have to trust the person beside you. You have to trust he's going to be there because as officers, when we come to work, um, our goal is to make it through the day, do our job, and then go home. Um, and sometimes that doesn't happen for us. And I mean, it's, it's part of the risk we take is the job we do. It's not part of the job, but it's a risk of the job. And uh, without somebody there to take care of you that you trust wholeheartedly, the job becomes a whole lot harder, which then you lose your effectiveness for the community that you serve, uh, the people you're there to protect. And uh, so it's nice to know that you do have an officer that you put your trust into. Uh, that way you know you get to go home, he gets to go home. The other person we may have to be out there to save is going to get to go home. Uh, so that's very important. So that's a benefit to you as an officer. Is that also a benefit to the community? Yes, sir. In what way? Because I know they're getting the service they deserve. If, if I have to worry about my safety, then I'm not. And it may affect me in far as the dealing with the community. You know, uh, there are times when you're out there by yourself that, you know, because if, if I can't, if I'm not, if something happens to me, I'm not able to help the people I'm, I'm there to protect and help. So it's nice to know that you have that other officer that's helped to protect you so that you can serve best the community that you're in. Thank you, Good morning, Austin Kidd. How are you? Pretty good, sir. Okay, thank you for being here this morning and thank you for your service, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, you ever testified in front of a jury um, as a police officer witness, sir? Yes, sir. Okay, a few or many occasions? A few. All right. And in those occasions, have you ever used um, expletives or profanity in front of a judge or a jury? No, sir. Can you imagine somebody doing that as a police officer? Yes, sir. You can. I can. It depends on the stress level, how up they tired they are, you know, where do they feel like the uh, people that are, you know, talking to him or against him and how they feel about his safety and everything like that. Uh, it's part of everyday language. It's not the great part of everyday language, I would say. Uh, we all try not to say explicit, uh, but I don't <coughs> know very many people who don't. Uh, in, in, in front of a jury in a court, you think that's appropriate? I'm not going to say it's appropriate, but I will say it happens. I wouldn't be judgmental or hold it against somebody if that was if that happened. Okay. You're aware that also I'll get that for Yes, sir. And he was punished accordingly by being ordered by your department to go to anger management. Yes, sir. Have you ever been ordered by your department to, to go to anger management? No, sir. Okay. Um, you ever been in a car accident, sir? Yes, sir. Okay. You ever pull a gun on somebody after a car accident? Not that I'm aware of. I have not, no. Okay. Do you think that that would be appropriate for somebody to, to pull a gun on somebody after a minor car accident? If, if I was there, it depends on the situation. I mean, with today's threats, you, know, you just never know what kind of person you're going to be confronting at that accident. That's a you know, reasonable and prudent today. If he sees something that may be disconcerting for him, then his sole protection right there is himself and his family there. So without me being there to know the whole story, I couldn't make a judgment call on that, but I can see where it might be reasonable to do that. Okay, and then afterwards, um, telling the police officers, taking them over to the car, showing the police officers a rifle, a helmet, Kevlar vest, and telling the police officers it could have been a lot worse, you think that would be appropriate in that circumstance? Well, I mean, if you're trying to, if you wanted to make it like if it could have been worse, like, hey, if I was some deranged person out here to really inflict bodily injury on people, then yeah, that's what he could mean. But he didn't step out with something like that, so it shows his mindset to be not that. He's saying, hey, if, if I was this type of person, this is what I would have got out with. 
but he didn't. Okay. So, I mean. Have you talked to Mr. Oliver about that incident, the car accident incident? No, sir. Okay, so he didn't tell you what was going through his mind or what Oliver no, was going the course of that? That was just uh, kind of what you would do in that situation? Is that what yes, that's what I would do. Okay. Are you on uh, Facebook, Officer King? Yes, I am. Okay, are you Facebook friends with Mr. Oliver? I don't think so, but I'm not for sure. I've got a lot of friends. Okay. First of all, Sean. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to show you what's been admitted in the evidence as State Exhibit Number 287A. And we're going to represent to you that this is a, fake, a Facebook post by the defendant, which was his cover photograph for a while. Can you read that off to the jury? So I'll never be in my life be as good as at anything else as I am at killing people. Had you ever seen this before? No, sir. I Would not. you be shocked to know that this was uh, Mr. Oliver's cover photograph for some time? Well, I don't know. It's, it's Facebook. I mean, it's people post a lot of things on there. So you don't necessarily take that stuff seriously? No. That's why it's called social media. All right. You don't think somebody would be offended by looking at something like that? So That's I, a police officer. Now these people get offended by a whole lot of things, so I mean, depends on I guess how your feelings are set, whether you get offended by that or not. Okay. You also testified that you would walk through the gates of hell with the defendant, is that correct? Yes, sir. Would you agree with me that police officers are kind of like a band of brothers and guys are very close? Very close. You would agree with that? Yes, sir. Would it be safe to say that you wouldn't want to see uh, Mr. Oliver getting into too much trouble during this process? I wouldn't wish anything on anybody. This has been a tragedy for all parties involved. I mean, parents have lost a son. Oliver over here is, you know, manned up and taking his consequences. Uh, it's just tragic, period. When you say uh, taking his consequences, and kind of expound on that. What, what do you mean by that? Well, he's here. He's here. He sits up here. He hasn't tried to run or escape justice. I mean, obviously, there are people out there in this world who would go, I'm, I'm out of here. I'm not going to be up here because I'm not going to trust the system. He sat here, and he, whatever transpires, whatever happens, he's, he's going to take the consequences for his actions. You're aware that Mr. Oliver, the defendant's case, is required to be here? Yes. Right? Thank you, officer. I'll pass it with you, sir. And you mentioned that police officers are a band of brothers. Yes, sir. Why is that? Because we put our lives in each other's hands. Every time we put on this uniform and get out of that vehicle or come to the workplace, there are people out there just because we wear this uniform hate us. And there are out there people out there who want to inflict injury and hurt us. So we have to be together because. Nobody else we can depend on that's going to watch our backs at work. It's going to be the guys that we serve beside. Just a couple more questions, John. Officer, you also testified on direct that, um, that officers there to, to protect the citizens. Is that correct? Yes. What do you think that should happen to an officer uh, who murders a citizen? If you're referring to what happened at this case, I wasn't there. I don't know what exactly transpired. I firmly believe that he thought he was protecting his, the other officer that was involved. Uh, the jury found him guilty of murder. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with it, but I mean, it's, it's up to them now what happens. I'm not going to make a judgment call for that. I wasn't there that night. I can't tell you what I thought about that night. Thank you, guys. I'll pass it to you. May this witness be finally excused? You may. Bruce? No objection. Sir, you may stand down with your excuse for any further service. Call your next witness, please. Call Teresa Vance. Good morning. Are you Ms. Vance? Yes. All right. Could you please come to the front of the court? Please watch your step. Before you have a seat, you could please face me and raise your right hand. That's where the testimony you're about to give will be the truth. Yes, sir. Please have a seat. Responding to questions from Mr. Gill, perhaps also Mr. Snipes, who's directly in front of you. Mr. Gill, this is your witness. You may proceed with Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. Good morning. 
you tell us your name, please? Teresa Vance. And spell it for us. T-E-R-E-S-A-V-A-N-C-E. And Ms. Vance, where do you live? Ball Springs. How long have you lived in Ball Springs? Um, oof, over 20 years. Okay. Uh, and whereabouts in Ball Springs do you currently live? Um, I live on Shepherd in apartments. Is that the uh, apartment complex that used to be owned by the Gorewoods? Yes. Okay. And while you lived there, uh, did you come to know a person by the name of Roy Oliver? Yes. And is it Mr. Is Mr. Oliver over here the second person to my right? Yes. How long have you known Mr. Oliver? Um, a little over five years, maybe in between five and six years. And how do you know him? Um, well, I knew he was a police officer in Balch Springs, and we were all excited to have him move in and help, you know, patrol our apartments and keep us all in line there. So you were excited to have a, have a police officer move in? Yes. <coughs> Why is that? Well, it's good to know you've got, especially in the springtime and summertime, the kids start getting more like want to come in and you know, off the streets, and there's a swimming pool, and just normal kid activity, and having him there, we felt safe. I want to use the word safe. I felt safe with him there. Was that just because you had a police officer there, officer there or was that because you had Roy Oliver there? Roy Oliver, as an individual. What was it about Roy Oliver that was, was different than having a a regular police officer there. Well, from the time I first met him moving in, um, we just kind of, I talked, introduced myself, and he was there. My grandson, he was seven, he wanted to help. And he just got into conversation with him. There was other children that lived there. Um, they come up and was talking to him, and they, some of them was troubled. And he talked to him. He was always there for anybody and everybody. He'd stand there in the rain even. I've seen him standing in the rain to talk to somebody that was having an issue or a problem or just wanted to talk in general. Did he have an effect on your grandson? Yes, pretty much so. What kind? Um, my grandson, from the time he was four years old, um, he went to kindergarten pre-K and he said he wanted to be a police officer. And he talked to Roy about that on several different occasions. He wanted to start out by being a police. And um, Mr. Oliver told him, he said, it's a good place to start because you're, you're saying you want to be CIA. So he talked to him a lot. And um, when he would start doing bad things and being bullied at school and wanted to bully back, uh, he talked to Roy about that. and. Boy, just had a good effect on him. Does he still want to be a police officer? Yes, sir. Is that because of Roy Oliver? Partially, I didn't talk to him, yes. I think you told us about a particular incident that, that uh, helped illustrate what kind of person Roy is. Tell us about that. Well, um, for instance, I mean, there, there was a bad situation going on at the apartment complex, and uh, it really could have turned super bad, not just for the owner or the manager of the apartment. So it could have been any particular person out there in that parking lot. Uh, Roy Oliver could have been very aggressive and... Um, he wasn't. He talked the man. He talked to the man. He got understanding with him and calmed him down. And uh, I feel that it could have been a super, super bad situation had he not been there. What kind of behavior was that man involved in? Um, I'm, I'm not assuming. You know, I can only say what I saw. But it appeared like he may have had some mental issues, and uh, he was getting very violent wanting to fight, uh, just screaming and hollering and, you know, lunging at people. Roy Oliver talked him down, talked his way up there to him, and um, 
he actually shook his hand. And I've seen him talk to uh, Mr. Oliver on several different occasions of him walking by. He'd say hello and you having a good day? Yes, I'm having a good day. Was there another incident where uh, there was a, a safety issue with someone that had fallen asleep in the part of the apartment complex? Uh, yes, there was a lady that, um, and I don't know who in the apartments told it, but when he arrived home, um, someone had told him there's someone in the playground area on a park, but you know, it's a picnic bench, not a park bench. There's a picnic table there. Um, she was laying there asleep. They couldn't get her awake. I don't know if they shook her or whatever. But he went back there and he talked to her, spoke with her, and found out she was there waiting on her stepdad, I believe is what the lady had told me the next day. And, um, but they, I mean, that was a very scary thing to be in a dark area like that and have someone sleeping and them not being able to wake up. Was Roy just the kind of guy that people in the apartment complex went to when they had an issue? I believe so. Did he help people? Yes. Did you ever see him turn anybody away that needed help? Never. Did he help people of all ages? Yes. Anybody who needed it? Yes. Was he... Uh, Somebody that, that the residents could count on? Yes. Was he somebody that you could count on? Definitely. We passed the witness. Cross examination? You know anything about the facts of this case, ma'am? Um, I wasn't there, so. Okay. So do you know that uh, the defendant grabbed his MC5 carbine rifle capable of firing AR-223 rounds? At exactly 11, 18, and 10 seconds p.m. Did you know that? I did not. I was told that, but I don't know. Did you know that he started sprinting up that hill on Barron at exactly 11, 18, and 28? I did not know that part. Did you know that you had nine seconds to evaluate what was going on with the guy that he was supposedly protecting? I'm not, a, you know, I'm not aware I was not there, so... Did you know that when he shot his first round, that car had already passed by the guy that he was supposedly protecting? That's what I see on the, on the live stream. Right. So you know that now, right? Yes. Okay. And you know that that second round was fired after that car had passed by Officer Gross. You know that, right? Uh, I heard that on the live stream, That's yes. That's shot that murdered poor Jordan Edwards. Do you know that now? I seen it on live stream. Okay. And you know that he kept <clears throat> on firing after that car even passed him. You know that? I seen it on live stream. Okay. Shots three, four, and five. That car was already down the road. You know that? I seen it on live stream. You know that all five of those rounds could have killed all five of those kids. And it's only by the grace of God that we don't have five dead bodies right now. Do you understand that? Yes, sir. I do. That's all I got, Judge. Mr. Is that the Roy Oliver that you know? Uh, no, but I didn't. I knew him personally there at the apartments. And it's that, you know, that's why, that's the Roy Oliver I know. No, sir. Very good. May the witness be finally excused. Yes, sir. Yes. Anyway, stand down. You're excused from any further service. Mr. Gill? We're checking. Okay. Will this be for the state? All right, Mr. Morgan. 
Go ahead, Mr. Gill, whenever you're ready, you may proceed. Would you tell us your name, please? My name is Linda Oliver. Okay, can you spell it for us, please? L-I-N-D-A-O-L-I-V-E-R. I am his mother. Of course, Roy is seated right over here directly to my right now. Right. Is that correct? Absolutely. And, and where were you living when Roy was born? When he was born, we were living in Colorado, in the suburb of Denver, North, North Glen, I believe it was. And how long did you live there? We were only in. Um, Denver area for about a Colorado period for about a year. Then we moved back to Texas. Okay. And where in Texas did you move to? Arlington. Uh, how long did you live in Arlington? About three years. Okay. Right. Um, was Roy an only child? No, he has uh, two half sisters, and he has a half sister um, with me. And uh, she is nine years older than he is. And then he has a half-sister with uh, his father. And uh, she would age. She is about four to five years older than Roy. Well, how old is Roy today? Roy today, I think, is, let's see, if this is 18... Isn't this awful? <laughs> he, uh, he was born in 79. So he will be 38, I believe. Sorry to put you on the spot. 38 or maybe a year older. So you're older or younger than the year is. He was born in 79. Yes, sir. That I know for sure. In a suburb of Denver. Yes. Okay. Moved to Arlington. Right. About three years. Right. And then where? Then we moved to Fort Worth. Okay. So, so after moving here from... Uh, from the Denver area, did he basically did he grow up and spend his formative years in the in the Dallas Fort Worth area? Yes. Did he go to Fort Worth school? Yes, he did. Which Fort Worth schools did he go to? He went to elementary at Daggett Elementary, the uh, Montessori at that time they called the Magnets, and then uh, from there he went to Wedgwood Middle School, and then after that he went to Pasco High School. And Pasco High School is located generally on the, on the south side of Fort Worth, is that right? Yes. Um, what kind of work did you do while growing up? I was in education. I was a school librarian. Uh, you become a teacher, then you can go on and get your certification as a librarian. In which school district did you work for? Fort Worth ISD. Which schools were you assigned to? I did, um, I started out at Manoha on the north side. Then I went to the south side to Hubbard Elementary. From there, I went to east side and did a dual assignment between uh, West Hanley Elementary and Horizons Middle School. After that, I went to, um, still on the east side, uh, if you're familiar with the area, it's called Stop Six, and I did uh, Dunbar Sixth Grade Center. It was all sixth grade. From that point, I was pegged to, to open the uh, Young Women's Leadership Academy. It was a brand new school, all girls school, college prep. Uh, the next year, they um, declared finan financial exigency. So I had to take a second school because of the small numbers of populations. So I finished my career at Young Women's and Middle Level Learning Center, which is an alternative uh, learning center, alternative behavior school. So being involved with the Fort Worth Independent School District, did it make it a little easier for you to keep up with Roy and his academic progress? Absolutely. As a single mother, I raised him, but I had a plethora of other librarians that were raising him also. And I take it that was a good thing? It was a very good thing. He couldn't get away with anything. <laughs> it's like, it must be awful to have a teacher and educator as a parent mm -hmm. in the uh, same district. How was his school performance? His school performance was, I'm going to say, basically good. He is dyslexic. And it was very problematic through his elementary years. He's very intelligent. His IQ was tested. He has a high IQ, not, not anything um, off the charts, but it's not low either by any chance. He's very intelligent. Um, 
But the dyslexia was just tormenting for him. He, and beginning in sixth grade, fourth grade he had a great teacher, fifth grade a great teacher, started getting a little bit better. By um, middle school, he was reading uh, on level. And before I knew it, he was reading John Jake novels. You know, it was just the historical fiction. Just from that point, he just read like wildfire, and he always loved uh, historical fiction. During his, during his high school years, did he uh, begin to get involved in, in some employment? Yes, actually, um, he started, uh, actually he started finding jobs when he was still in uh, like fifth grade. He was mowing some lawns and actually before fifth grade, he was dog sitting for people um, all the time. He's just a natural with dogs and children. And he started dog sitting then. He started doing some yards, which he did not like it. He liked the money that he earned from it. So he, would, he much enjoyed mowing other people's yards rather than doing it at home, let's put it that way. And he, uh, then he, when he was 15, it, um, it, very few places employed anybody at the age of 15. But he went into Six Flags and I think actually skipped one interview level. I'm not sure, but he went in with his khakis and his preppy shirt and his organizer. He'd already created a, a resume. He'd heard me talking about <coughs> creating resumes because I was in college. I think his eighth grade year was my first year to be in the district, if not seventh or eighth grade. But um, he heard me talking about resumes, wanted to know what one was, so we just sat down and created one, a skills-based one for him. And did that, that money help out the household? Yes, it did, a lot. Um, of course, it covered his extra expense. I didn't hear, Mom, can I have some money? You know, it's my often. But uh, yes, it wasn't long before he would find his school clothes and I would give him a set budget to work with. He would go buy his own clothes and then anything extra he knew was on him to do. And he, uh, he was a very, still is a very prudent shopper. He, was, he, he had to mature before his age. So. From, well, he was raised in a single parent home? Yes, from the time he was in uh, between second and third grade. It's been 30 years. Probably by that time, the older sister was out of the house, too? Yes. Okay, so just, just you and Roy. Exactly. Okay. And after the, after the employment at Six Flags, did he go on to uh, other employment opportunities? Yes, he worked for, um, I get confused, is it Macy's now? It was Foley's, I guess, whenever he went to work. They're working in loss prevention. And um, he moved through, uh, several different jobs at Six Flags. And I believe he worked loss prevention. If not, he was very interested in it at Six Flags and then carried it over into the non-Six Flags world. After that, he, um, he was thinking about becoming a firefighter and had really wanted to do that. We had moved to Dow Worthington Gardens, which is a suburb surrounded by um, Arlington or Pantego. And we received a uh, newsletter once a month from the mayor, the mayor's note or whatever it was. And they said they had a need for volunteer firefighters. I saw that, I handed it to him and said, yeah, does this interest you? And at that point, um, he was already out of high school. We just didn't have a point at which he needed to move out. He, he paid his share, he didn't pay uh, rent, so to speak, but he did the electric bill. He, um, if he didn't take care of the yard, he was responsible for paying whoever took care of the yard. I put that on him to do whatever, you know, whatever his choice was on that. Um, he, he went and was a volunteer firefighter. I remember him going through the training. They had to go through the same training as a professional. And somewhere down the line, he was uh, between his work and the volunteering, I think there was something about radio code. He knew radio code. That's what it was from Six Flags. And they said, like a son, we need a dispatcher. So he got into dispatching and uh, went on from there. So that kind of began his, his career in law enforcement, is that right? Yes, sir. And, of course, you also know that he, he volunteered for the military. 
Yes, sir. And when he did that, were you proud of him? I was a mommy. <laughs> it makes me proud to think about it. I guess I was very proud of him. I, he'd spoken of it. Actually, he'd been itchy since 9-11. He had wanted to go after 9-11 and help in New York and stuff like that, but he had no training to do that. So we were eating um, dinner, and he brought it up again. We were at a restaurant down from our house. And he brought it up again, and a light just went off. He's looking for my approval, my blessing. Uh, that was a war I was proud of. But uh, I remember putting down my fork and said, Honey, this is your life. You make your decisions based on your needs now, not on Mama's say, do this or do that. And uh, the next day he was at the, oh, thank you. He was at the recruiter. He did it. And I think uh, about three weeks, it was right around uh, St. Patrick's Day, somewhere in there, March, that uh, he was calling. And you know how the military does. They say you're leaving this day and they call you four or five days before and said, so we need you down here this afternoon. So, uh, yeah. So off you went. Off you went. It was a big adventure. And he served two tours? He served two tours. He, um, Actually, before that, he did training at Fort Benning, I believe it was, in Georgia. And there's something I'd like to offer up, if it's okay. He didn't do uh, basic and then AIT. He did a longer one. I cannot remember what that was. But I think people need to know that before they were doing, he was doing bayonet training, he called me, collect, and we were talking. He said, Mom, I don't think I can do this. I thought I could. He'd already been through the gas chamber, the awful <coughs> stuff of that. He survived it. He said, Mama, I just don't know if I can do this training. I said, dear, pray about it. And you decide what you need to do. Go talk to chaplain if you need to. And do what you need to do. And I think in order to serve his country, that was a necessity. So he did that. And then he did go on to serve two tours. He was, uh, I remember the night he deployed on the first one, I flew to Fort Lewis to see him on off and be a support for his wife. And he came out as they were going in one line and out the other. He comes out of this building and said, he's got all this gear then. He goes in with that but comes out with it all. I said, did you ever think you'd see me looking like this? I'm like, well, what the heck, yes. I did. He said, you know, I didn't. I didn't think about it. And uh, those are some of the last words we had before that deployment. But uh, he was over. He was, uh, he enjoyed serving his country. I'm not going to say that he enjoyed the war, but he enjoyed his fellow sol soldiers, his brothers. And I am so proud of him for that. And he served his country honorably. Absolutely. And when he returned home, uh, he got involved in law enforcement. When he returned home from the second deployment, he was, um, by that point, he had planned to be career military. And he was thinking ahead. And that's a little bit part of the employment part that we didn't cover. But he was thinking ahead then and changed to a different job with the city so that he would have retirement, things of that sort. But he was thinking ahead once he was in the military and thought that was a good place for him to be to get the benefits that would be there. He could get college. He could get uh, a retirement and then go into uh, uh, whatever career he was going to do. But stop loss was going on at that time. And... Um, if you were not under contract, you had to leave. They didn't ask, hey, who wants to get out of the Army now? And let them go. I truly believe he would have been the last one to put up his hand. And the first one to say I wanted to stay. So he was, he was very disappointed, very disappointed in that. So he lost his uh, military career. And he moved over to the law enforcement side. Yes, sir, he did. Were you proud of his service in the war? Absolutely. He struggled so hard 
I mean, keep in mind the dyslexia component. So he's taking, uh, he'd taken in one or two college courses before, but um, he's doing this. You fill a tester out. So that's how dedicated, and he's not a good, great test taker, not am I. Uh, but he, he just knuckled down, that's what he was going to do. He was committed to it, and he wanted to serve. He made it through the first time. And during his law enforcement career, did he uh, meet in group? Um, yes. And uh, did he mean Woodstar family? Yes, it is. Kind of an interesting situation, but yes, it did. <laughs> and his beginning of family with Ingrid was uh, unbeknownst uh, coincided with his starting a family with his ex-wife. Yes, but we should be very clear on that. If I go, if I'm wandering off, let me know. Well, they were married. I'm the mom. I want to be grandma again. <laughs> I'm like, y'all think about babies? Said, well, we've, we've been trying. If they're trying to have a family and they don't have a family, I'm going to the base. It's the first doctor I can find who can help me get pregnant. His ex-wife never did. He had this longing to be a father. And I truly believe that child was conceived in order to try to pull him back in. She never stopped wanting to be married to him. Then um, he was honest with Ingrid about it and everything. And I, I don't know all of the circumstances about that pregnancy. I've concluded some, but I have two of the sweetest, what I call, um, Oh, now I'm nervous and I can't think, but my little, um, I call them fraternal twins in an abnormal situation. They're, they're just cute as can be and they loved each other very much, and, but we haven't been able to see her in a while. But the, the kids loved each other very much. And they both, their father, they both loved very much. Now, Roy and Ingrid have a little boy. Yes. And what's his name? His name is Tob. It rhymes with... Bob, but it has a Spanish A in it, so it's T A B, but Tob. And Roy and his ex-wife have a little girl. Yes. What is his ex-wife's name? Amy. And what is the daughter's name? Alexa. In fact, her name is Alexa Awat. Awat is a uh, Kurdish word meaning hope. That uh, he he loved uh, his tour. And up in the Kurdish area, so he wanted to uh, honor that and the people there. And we heard earlier, I believe they're 12 days apart? <laughs> yes, they are. Right. It was a busy July. Uh, sounds like it. Sounds like it. And, and you, they kept you uh, a busy grandmother. They did, and I loved every bit of it. And uh, the Royal was paying child support to Amy? Yes. Alexa? To my knowledge, yes. Okay. And then he's also... Um, uh, living in the household with uh, Ingrid and Tom. Yes, uh, they had an apartment in Box Springs at the time he was born. And we've heard this morning that in about 2016 they moved out of the apartment in Box Springs and, and where did they move to? I'm sorry, when? Oh, around 2016. Okay, they um, moved, um, I retired. I had, um, I've been, had the itch anyway for a while, and I had um, massive melanoma on my leg, and the babies were, were here, and I thought, is this how I want to spend the rest of my life? And I was driving to Box Springs on the weekend to, to take care of Tom because they both work weekends. So um, I decided, it's time. I went and talked to the, my retirement consultant. And I saw that I could do it. I did. And they, they moved to be closer to you? No, actually just the opposite. Um, I wasn't sure where I was going to go. I was driving down Arling, Cooper Street in Arlington one day. And I was like, I've got to get the heck out of this traffic <laughs> as soon as I get out. So I didn't know where I was going to go. I thought about Waco. 
then they needed me for the weekend babysitting, which I enjoyed. So I thought about just getting a uh, travel trailer and living over somewhere accessible to Box Springs so that, you know, they could uh, have the advantage of uh, free babysitting. And I got the advantage of uh, being closer to the family and everything. And we were uh, looking around for places and it just hit me that shall we get a place where we all live on the same property, not necessarily in the same house, but on the same property. And everybody was all on board, so we started looking for places with a mother-in-law suite or a little apartment or something <coughs> right there or adjacent properties that I could purchase. And we did. had occasion, I take it, to see uh, Roy as a father? Oh, yes. And uh, tell the jury what kind of father Roy is. I will tell you, I've told some of my best friends, that kid is stinking amazing as a father. He is just a natural. He is the first, and that's past me with an educational background to pick up on Tobbs, um, I guess you would say symptoms or signs of, um, it's not Alzheimer's, that's me, <laughs> of autism. Um, I had noticed some things and then the uh, little preschool academy that he was going to, the director picked up on some things and I just asked him one day, how in the world did you pick up on all of that without any background. He'd never been around little ones and everything. And he just said, he's my son. He noticed immediately. I noticed the language loss. He, he noticed the loss of eye contact. And we were, you know, we were shattered to hear it. But he's the greatest miracle ever. <laughs> he's so much fun. But uh, I've never heard him complain, being my son, about getting up in the middle of the night to do a bottle. Uh, and this was back on the nights when he would be home. He worked a night shift or in the daytime to get a bottle. If the baby, take for instance, the diagnosis of um, autism, as soon as we realized, hey, there's something going on, it's probably this, he had the child at the pediatrician the next day. Not me, not his mother. His mother went with him, but he called and got the appointment and told them that. I really want him seen. I'm very uncomfortable with this. It was the end of the week. I think it was a Thursday, maybe even a Friday, that the doctor's appointment took place. Um, and then after they went through, they got in with children's, got the uh, diag formal diagnosis. And they, um, I said, honey, how are you dealing with this? And he said, well, it was really hard to take in writing. But I knew it was coming. So we'll take care of it. Maybe not word for word, but very close. And is that something that, that he and Ingrid have had to deal with? Absolutely. And, and have you also done what you can? Oh, absolutely. I'm, I'm his caretaker. Um, and right now, uh, he goes to uh, half day pre K with four year olds for the um, social development and the speech language immersion it, because he lost all of his vocabulary. He used to walk, crawl through the house going mama, daddy, uh, grandma. Crawling through the house, come to my apartment. <laughs> you know, get the, it's attached to the house. So my quarters, uh, I'm accessible but apart. Then the, uh, it just stopped. It just stopped. So, um, I'm right there, I'm his caretaker, whether his father was working in law enforcement or after that came to a sudden stop, whatever they were doing, then I'm there and I have a small business, uh, which I'm not gonna, going to close, but um, I had the business so that uh, it could flex around my hours, Todd was a priority. Um, since his separation from all Springs, has, has Roy been working? Within, I may be wrong, but very close to just a week, he had another job. And it wasn't near law enforcement, he was loading boxes on trucks. But that, that was his first concern. 
I need to provide. Has he been provided? Absolutely. At a much shorter, lower pay scale, <laughs> no, but yes, he went in and started out part-time and was able to get on full-time so that he would have full benefits for his family. Describe uh, Roy as a husband. Ingrid could probably give you a better description than I could, but um, I've always seen him as loving. I would say he probably puts his child maybe first, or at least even kill with his wife. Um, but I, of course I've seen him much more with Ingrid than I did with Amy, but I always uh, my perception was always a, a good husband, good provider, uh, a good person. How is he with, with people outside his family? Um, and he's not going to be the one to um, be the life of the party, but he is going to be at the party and uh, contribute to some of the fun there. And um, um, he's not a follower, he's a leader. So if he found him someplace where um, drugs or something like that were involved, he would walk away. They'd be kind of foolish to pull that out in front of him anyway. Did you ever, in your wildest imagination, think you'd ever be sitting up on a witness stand when your son was on trial for something? Oh, did, in my mouth? Absolutely not. No. You understand what has taken place so far in this trial, is that right? Yes, sir. You understand this jury's found Roy guilty. I do. You understand now that they have to decide what sentence they feel he should have. I understand that. I can't say I agree with all that, but I understand that, yes. What are you asking this jury to do about the punishment phase of the trial? I'm asking you to take into consideration several things. First, he's a wonderful father. Next, I would ask you, he's a good person. Next, I would uh, ask you to consider Ingrid, of course. Yeah, I'll throw myself in there too. But consider his son. <laughs> He doesn't need, my son was raised with a father in prison, and deservedly so. That man deservedly needed to be in prison. And I know how hard it is to be a single mother. I believe that my son is the more responsible of the two parents, especially when it comes to Tom's needs and the uh, affliction. But to think of Tob and Alexa, but Tob with these special needs, he is a daddy's boy. He is a daddy's boy. He, his favorite word right now is mama, but I think it's because he likes to hear the vibration on his lips of the M, because we'll go through different M sounds. And he started calling, instead of dada, it's D now. We don't know why he changed that, but he did but we don't know what's processing in his little head. But he is the sweetest thing, and he deserves every chance in life. And he, he needs so much more help just to get on track. Like I said, he's very high functioning. He's very high functioning. And more than one professional has said, I wish we could check his IQ. He's a very smart baby. He loves to honest to train watches YouTube and on his own, he'll build all these complex tracks and systems and things like that and have all these different trains running around do all of them. One gets stuck or this one's going to need a switch and he's jumping from place to place. But he can't verbalize and gets so frustrated. He needs his father's love. He needs his father's income. 
he needs uh, his father's guidance and he needs his father's support in obtaining the services that he needs. Um, I know I probably sound like such a mommy right now, but I'll boil down. He's such a good man and good father. Asking this jury to be uh, as lenient as they can for Roy? I would pray. I've done a little bit of research, and this is what I think I know. I think the minimum sentence is five years, and at least half of that would have to be served. I pray that you will find that so that at that point when he comes out, that Tall would only be about, he would be in his fifth year, five years plus a few months. So um, that, that's my prayer because it could still have such an impact on that child's life at that. show you what have now been marked as defendants exhibits numbers 34, <laughs> 35, yes. 36, yes. and 37. Right. And ask if you recognize each of those photographs. I have seen them or similar ones. Okay. And do you recognize all the all the young folks in them? Oh yes I do. They're my grandchildren. In, in 34, you mentioned that you uh, that, that Todd likes to build trains and structures. Yes, he does. And is that Todd with one of his creations? I, I believe this was very recent. And if it's the, the particular one that I recall, he was sitting there saying he's building and then he hands track to somebody else and he points and he'll show you where he wants it. In uh, 35, who do we see there? That is both Tob and Alexa. Is that a fairly recent photograph also? No. That is, uh, oh my goodness. They may have been, it's at least, it's over a year. It was probably spring of last year. It's kind of, it's grandma's to me. Okay, 36? Probably about the same. And who's in 36? Oh, 36 is just Alexa. Okay. And how about 37? 37 is those chubby babies. Okay, that's, that's a, a while back. Yes, okay. quite a while. They're, they're probably less than a year old there? Right. Very much so. Oh, he was so chubby there. <laughs> He's changed so much. We offer 34 through 37. No objection, Your Honor. 34 through 37, inclusive or admitted, you may publish. We pass the witness. Cross examination. Uh, Your Honor, do you mind if I begin listening to the potential pictures? Okay. <laughs> Is it possible for me to get a sip of water?
Thank you, Mr. Thompson. You can bring it up to the witness. Thank you so much. <clears throat> I'm going to ask you a few questions. Okay. All right. Please do. Um, you love your son, right? Absolutely. And you don't want to see anything bad happen to him? Absolutely. And just to be fair, uh, you completely disagree with the jury's decision, right? I, I do. Yeah, you think they got it wrong? I do. Okay. Um, and you said that uh, your son has a high IQ, right? Yes. Okay. So he knew what he was doing out there that night. I can't answer that. I wasn't there, and I've never been in that sort of a situation. So I, I just... But with a high IQ, you, you would agree with me that someone, you know, knows that I would agree that he was... If you just give me one oh, second. I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, that someone that shoots five rounds into a car full of kids uh, reasonably knows that somebody's going to get killed. Again, I wasn't inside my... Uh, his head, okay. but I would also say, uh, knowing him and as intelligent as he is, he thought he was doing the right thing. Okay. And you raised him right, you said? Yes. Okay. Um, did you raise him to pull guns out on women and children? Absolutely not. What about cursing at jurors? Um, I can't speak to that because I know there was some sleep deprivation involved okay. and I know how I am when I'm sleep deprived. So y'all talked about it before? Yes, okay. Okay. just briefly. Okay, um, and you said that he didn't enjoy the war, the, the war that he was in? He enjoyed serving his country but he didn't enjoy the, the consequences of war. You mean like killing people, having to kill people? Right, and the uh, just the, the goriness of it. And, <coughs> Well, you would agree with me on that at some point he started liking to kill people. Based Not on at Facebook all. Post, but uh, let's uh, clarify that. Sure. Uh, again, it was in the testimony. He reposted, because I had to go back and find that. Okay. And just to clarify, because I heard one thing, then I heard another thing in the courtroom. Sure. That post, that was not his quote. It was a repost. But it was a repost that the topic of the post is, I don't, I assume everybody knows the 22 a day phrase, and it's that 22 of our veterans commit suicide every day. And it's awareness <coughs> to that. Somebody, and it's because, the quote down there, if you've read about it, that is a common quote, if not those very, it's a common thought of the veterans. You know, I've, I've come back, I serve my country, and I'm out of the military now. And let's talk about Vietnam vets can really speak to this because they're included in this. That basically the Army taught me how to kill. And not all Army careers lead to a civilian career. And they're just lost. They're out of their element with society. I'm just going to show you, Ms. Oliver, mm -hmm. what's been admitted into evidence in State Exhibit 287A. So I know you mentioned that it was a post and it was a repost, and, but would you agree with me that um, it says cover photo here? It says album name. I don't know if it uh, um, was ever used as a cover photo. I mean, he might be able to tell you, but I never saw it as a cover photo. No, I'm asking, do you see the word cover photos? Here? Yes. Okay. I All see right. the album name in this cover, okay. cover photos. Okay. All right. So then this is not just a, a post or a repost. He actually made it as cover photo on his Facebook page, right? No, that, that's exactly what I just said. I can see that it's in a file called okay. cover photos. I do not know that he ever used it as a cover photo. Okay. And but if he did, I'm sure it was for the awareness. The 22 a day is a big campaign. The awareness of how good he is at killing people? No, ma'am. I'm sorry. I well, believe I you understand sense. the the suicide among our veterans who have served our nation. 22 a day take their lives. 
And you said that you were proud of his service in law enforcement. Right? Absolutely. Were you proud of what he did on the night of April 29, 2017? No, I don't think he is. Uh, the, the night that uh, was a morning for us when it came in and we were brief, told about it and everything, we all cried. I mean, he could have been one of my students. He looks like a student that I had in sixth grade, at the sixth grade center. So, uh, no, there was, we're, we're not a family that says, if these parents had done that, if they should have done this, why didn't this, you know, no. Um, he thought he was, uh, I heard his testimony, eliminating the threat. It, it, it wasn't that it was a person at that point. Okay. It was a possible danger. And if I heard you correctly, you said that you thought that five years was appropriate for a shooting 15 year old in the head and killing him instantly? That is not what I said. Okay, so you don't think five years is appropriate? No, I think it could be appropriate. That is the range that the state has set. Well, let me ask you. Between you know, five okay. and life, I believe. Sure. Let me ask you, what do you think is appropriate for someone who murders a 15 year old uh, unarmed teenager? I believe we have to look at the full situation, the full circumstances, and weigh them judiciously. Uh, the same thing uh, uh, in teaching school. We had a uh, discipline plan, uh, especially at the girls' school, we used a um, merit system or demerit system. We started with demerit and, and then you could earn merits. But if they were caught stealing or, I'm thinking of one situation in particular when I say that. Stealing, fighting, whatever. Then we came together as a committee. I sat in on a couple of the committees because I was, did not have the children day to day but just saw a different part of them. I had a, a child she was just precious in the library. I found out what she had confessed to doing when she was caught. She went back to her home school. Okay, well let me bring it a little closer home. Okay. You said you have a daughter, daughter as well? Yes. Okay, so what would you want to happen to a person that killed your 15-year-old child? I would want everyone to look at it and be judicious and fair. Okay. And um, you mentioned that uh, your son, the defendant, wanted to, he longed to be a dad. Absolutely. And you watched all the testimony, so you know that Odell still longs to be fathering Jordan, right? I'm sorry, I, I, I heard... Like, you I've heard Odell Edwards say that he, I mean, that he still longs... He oh, I'm sure he did. I did not son. hear that testimony. I was, um, uh, was that yesterday maybe, and I was I was on grandma duty, whatever, okay. whatever time it was, I was on grandma duty going to pick up Tob or whatever. Okay. So, um, you agree with me that your son has stripped him of that privilege, right? I will agree that Mr., uh, I'm sorry, I want to say Mr. Odell, <laughs> I know that's not correct. I agree that he has been stripped of the privilege. And also, you mentioned you wanted to be a grandmother at the end, and you know that Charmaine and Odell wanted to be grandparents to yeah, the kids. I don't know their thoughts, I don't know them. So you didn't watch the testimony at all yesterday? No, I didn't oh. see it at all. I was driving. Okay. All right. But you also, you would agree with me that your son stripped them of being able to be grandparents to any of Jordan's kids? In the I would agree that they've been stripped of the privilege. I would agree with that, but did my son strip them? I think it was an awful set of circumstances that stripped them. You also mentioned that Tom, um, he still needs his dad, so Todd will still be able to see his dad, right? I'm sorry? Todd will still be able to see his dad in prison if you all choose to take him? I I would assume so. I'm and not you'll still be able to see your son in prison? You're right. I mean, you would agree with me that uh, George, I'm sorry, Odell and Charmaine will never get that privilege again to see Jordan except at a garden yard. I, I accept that. I think we're both living our own version of hell. That's what it is. We have nothing further. Thank you very much. Members of the jury, we're going to recess um, a little bit earlier than I thought. So please uh, go with the sheriff and wait for your instructions.
All right, New Jersey. Thank you, Sheriff. Y'all may be seated. The record should reflect that you know, outside the presence of the jurors, uh, Mr. Hill, we're still waiting on the interpreter service to get the interpreter to Which means I believe we're out of witnesses for you at the current time. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. Are there any matters that we can take up outside the jurors' presence now? Well, we have a matter we could take up probably in chambers, be very, very briefly, and then we could probably work on the jury charge. Okay. Then let's do that. So let's uh, take a recess. We'll take that matter up in chambers, uh, and then we'll work on the jury charge. So as soon as we're done here, you all be looking at the jury charge that I sent around. And we'll hear arguments and objections there too. And we'll go from there. Yes, sir. Is this supposed to be an ex party? Yes. <coughs> there anything else? Yeah. All right, very good. What's the reason? Judge, you know when you want us back? Okay. This won't take but 10 minutes. Okay. Uh, so I'll see y'all in 10 or 15 minutes. We can talk about the jury charge at that time. What's the reason?